So, it's the autumn of 2020, and uh, this is Mick Rock. And um, what is going on here uh, at Mrs. Salon um, is, um, well, she started to do it recently, to treat it like a salon and have an artist she, uh, well, very specifically me, so we have a friendship. Um, but to treat it like a salon where it's not, you know, hardcore, there's nothing wrong with galleries. <laughs> she do quite a lot of business with galleries, but this is of a different nature. The similarity is that the works are available. But you also get to see them, you know, with a life of their own floating about a bit. This, however, it was a gentleman I got to know early in 72. And there's a man who, who changed a lot of things, a lot of perceptions in our culture. I mean, he was a brilliant man. He happened to also be amazingly photogenic. You know, I don't know. Perhaps you shouldn't have been allowed so much, David. But he was a kind man. I like David. He was uh, an intuitive. Once he got a taste in that summer of 72, that finally his ideas were breaking through, he was off to the races. He was like, Phew. he was very pumped up, but he was a nice guy. He really was. Life on Mars is the video some 20 years ago, David gave me the copyright to the visual. Um, well, no, anyway, there are several of them, but this one, is um, I've probably made more of selling prints than I have uh, owning the copyright to the video. But I love the video. I think it's, uh, and David loved it. It was so kind of minimalist with the little tweaks here and there. And then of course in 2016, the record label got me to do a new version, to go with, with a new version of the song Life on Mars. But he does look, I always thought that he looked like a space doll. It's very, he was a magical figure. He, I mean, there were several dancing around. <laughs> look, uh-oh, there's Freddie. Very clear eye. I look back at my picture and go, he was very clear eyed. He knew. And he would talk about it. Uh, I mean, not an unbearable amount. And I don't, I don't mind. I'm happy for talented people to talk about their talent because I get to watch them then. But he looks, you know, there was two or three years there we were really quite friendly, you know. And I got a lot of fantastic pictures of him. So, and down there, if you sink down on your knees, sir, that is, I call that White Queen. And they do, that might have been the cover of the Queen 2 album. It was a bit of a toss-up. I mean, not to my way of thinking, nor to Freddie's. But I think the other ones, since they hadn't really sold many records, they knew it was going to have a big reverberation, which they loved. But I think, you know, there was a certain modesty in there. I think they knew they were good. But there was a certain, Freddie didn't, have to feel constrained like that. So, you know, he and I, but he applied the muscle, and uh, I think everybody's been happy since. So, over there, this is clustering around a certain period. That up there is Dude 72. Now, therein lies a definite tale. Um, there was uh, David ha had produced a band called Mott the Hoople uh, and written a song called All the Young Do's and I was in charge of the cover. I've talked to Ian Hunter about it all and we don't know why <laughs> I mean, All the Young Do's. But I tell you, many years later, there was another band, because it didn't go on the cover, this other band thought they could... Uh, Tint it. They want to put a tint on it. That's all right. That's what they'll own, the version with the tint. Um, 
because the black and white was the thing. Look at it. I've got several frames of it. But he, uh, and he was like that. It wasn't an artificial thing or a fashion, nothing. They, and I had some other ones, but this was the one. But in the end, there was some kind of design for an old um, American publication from back in the 20s. But I can't, I, it's, even though I got paid a lot more money um, in, um, in the early part of this millennium than I would have back then, so perhaps God was looking out. It should have been on that cover. And, and in a way, they belong together. The Ramones, well, I knew the art director at the record label, uh, John. Um, and I'd shot, I'd shot the Dead Boys for him, and I'd shot the Talking Heads. And he, came, he said, Mick, he said, I've bl blown the budget about three times. I, they didn't like any of the pictures. Um, if they don't like what you're doing, they'll walk out. In principle, they don't like photographers. So we just said, yeah, I'd love to do that. You know, the tricky stuff. <laughs> and in the end, look, I wasn't going for wild expressions. I just wanted, dang me. And it stands out from their other covers, which, which, which is they, what they wanted this. In the, they came in those T-shirts. But after we had done what was ended up being the cover shot, this is the one that I've put in shows because they got the leather jacket. That's, you know, that's the Ramones. So, ah, Dave El David. Um, well, he's a master. He was. Well, he, he was very Buddhist in his thinking. That song changes on the, I think something happened to him spiritually during the making of Hunky Dory. And um, not that this is anything to do with it, this is 2002. But I love it. Look, I've got a load of pictures from that show. Not all have been seen because there's so many other friends. I mean, David, especially David and Ziggy. Hedwig, John Cameron Mitchell. I mean, I've done quite a lot of work with him over a period of time. But this, it's hard when you make a thing out of an idea as much as out of, I mean, this is, there are those that hold it in very high regard. And he's been, oh, his mummy just died, he told me, because he's been looking after her. He's, He's fabulous, what can I tell you? I mean, I want to fall in love I, 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 in a way with the people I photograph. And of course, with Miss Deborah, not hard. Amazing. Amazing, really. The bones and, you know, and these shots. There are two, there are three that I show around. The blue Debbie Harry, Pink Debbie Harry and the orange Debbie Harry. And they, that was just one of those days where the gods were smiling. And although it's corny, there are days when, I mean, today you go, I don't know, man. Well, it's this election thing. So it's bound to be grey. So, uh, but anyway, yes, I've got a lot of great pictures. I've done a book with Debbie. She's an amazing, amazingly beautiful lady. And she's in her 70s now. And she still looks fabulous. She's, uh, well, of all the ladies to come out of rock and roll, I'm not getting into who's better and who's, I'm just talking about their thing. She's the one in the end, with all due respect, to have the most powerful impact on the culture at large. I think with certain other people, significant, but uh, I think her shadow will, uh, will last. Daft Punk. They wanted, uh, if, they, if we'd been living in the same place, I would have done more 
with them, but they love these pictures. They, uh, it was a Playboy men's fashion rock spread. They did that for a few years and I shot for them. And this was, we had to go to Vegas because they were playing there. And, um, and I hung out with them afterwards. And they were very, you know, very, felt very introverted and quiet and probably quite intellectual young Frenchmen. And this now, you know, people tell you, Daft Punk, that's like, whew, you know, that's like, that is legendary stuff. Um, how, they wouldn't let me photograph them without the gear on, because I hung out with them for quite a while. But, and I di did want slightly intimate, but I didn't want to make them uncomfortable. I was happy just to hang with them. But still, and the name Daft Punk, it's just a, <laughs> it's such a whacked out name. But I'm very happy that I have this whole session with them. For your pleasure, right here we have several of the characters from that period. I mean, that's the period that people identify as a photographer. You know, the man who shot the 70s. So puffs and punks, but some serious ones creatively. Because ultimately, beyond all the lunacy, it's like people, oh, look what you did for Queen. I said, no. I said, if they had the music, it wouldn't have mattered if they messed up the visual thing. Uh, as it happens, I did uh, have this image that has stood the curve, the passage of time. But uh, no, I did what I did. I wasn't, um, I may, I did seem to do something, especially earlier on. This was taken, uh, I think it was the beginning of the last Ziggy tour in England, probably in Earl's Court. And Pierre Laroche, we actually, and he started it, used to call him Pierre Le Puff because he was, wow, he was a bit of a madame, you know? Anyway, that's, uh, and that picture, because it is a performance one, it's not, set up, but obviously, whatever, I got lucky. I've been lucky quite a lot though, you know? And then there's Iggy, look at that. Well, I just shot it. That and Transformer were shot a night apart in the same venue in London in the summer of 1972. You know what, I think, I think he looks a bit like an iguana. I think that's got, and that was his first band, the Iguanas. That's for all that, but he looks like, he always looks like this amazing Iguana. And again, this one, although it didn't do very much when it came out, it has stood the test of time. It is an amazing man, look at him, he's still going, he still puts out, he has a great sense of humor. Now, Lou Reed. Uh, Lou, I learnt a lot from Lou. He was a very interesting character. The most complicated one I ever met, I think. Then Pharrell, we're doing a bit of a time travelling. And um, when would that have been? About 2010, 2012. And Mick Jagger, well, it's not that I'm, I've got quite a few, but it doesn't represent my work particularly. On the other hand, it's such an amazing, it looks like a fucking rooster. I think, well, it's about as perfect as you can get. Sometimes a boy gets fucking lucky, you know? Sorry about the language, sorry. Now here, we have not only the amazing Kate Moss, you know, that's, I did some pictures she was wearing, you know, T-shirts made up with, I think well, one was Iggy, one was David, and one was Lou. But I love it, the whole, I was really fucking around with the lighting that day. And then Janelle Monet, wow. I, 
whoa, amazing. Now she's blown up into a big movie star. She was, I listened to her do interviews as well as photographed her. And she thought, whoa, she's, I mean, she's totally self creative Even the way she styled, that's her. And then Madonna <laughs> in 1980. She was a dancer. Certainly there was no conversation about rock and roll, but she, a guy called Bleeker Bob, who for many years down in the West Village, he had record stores, and uh, especially they specialized in 12 inch. And he would, some t I mean, there was nothing weird going on. Keep that for like 4 a.m. But she, and I just did a few snaps. I didn't think about it. And, but I didn't say, oh, stick your tongue out, nothing like that. I did, never did that. Um, but, but she did that. There's, there's not many of them, there's just a few, and I've mislaid them in my moves. I know I have them though, tucked away in one of the many boxes. Ah, David, yeah, with the hunky dory album artwork. He was, uh, this is an early session. I mean, he's not heavy on the makeup, as you can see, that, that will come. Truman Capote and Andy Warhol. This would have been around the Christmas of 1980. I had been doing some work with High Times magazine and got to know um, Tony Brown, who was the art director. And uh, so, you know, do you want to shoot these two? Like, yeah, Truman Capote and Andy Warhol. They were both supposed I don't know who took it, Tony probably could talk them into it. Um, they were both supposed to wear Santa outfits. But it didn't matter, I mean, look. <laughs> and he just, uh, and that's, um, you see like the old uh, a Polaroid. That one of Andy's people would have stolen that. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, <laughs> It's a, it's a, what can I, claims can I make? I mean, it is those two. And I think just about anything uh, of Andy uh, has a fascination for lots of people, especially because he hardly said anything. <laughs> he, was, he was an artful dodger. He would, people would, oh, you this and that and that and that, and he'd go, I don't think so. <laughs> And you go, when you look back, you go, oh, brilliant. Look how early he was doing that. And the media wasn't as out of control there. Nowadays, we're like wall-to-wall -wall media. You go, how do you get your way out? Of and everybody's a character, everybody. But then I always saw people as characters anyway. More than flesh and blood. I saw, a, the, and the Iggy one, I love that one. Oh, and Tim Curry and Rocky Horror. What happened with Rocky Horror was Jim Sharman, who had directed, it was really an Australian opera um, director, but obviously he was young at the time. Um, and he, he hustled it. I mean, and it, it happened. He, he then went back to Australia and he never did anything else. I think he did a lot of things but I'm not aware of anything else that had the impact that that movie, I mean, it's, uh, and it came in the wake of David Bowie and Lou. It came in the wake of all that stuff that was going on. That's, I, like, I have several close-ups of him that I really like. I think this one probably because of the pink gloves but it never really stopped the, the subterranean, uh, glammy, punky way of subverting things. And these are all subverts in their own way. And then Iggy, right on the end there, we had this electric violin. And I said, just to see him with a violin of any sort. So, um, and he's an amazing character. Yeah, I mean, he's. He's not trying to pretend. When you talk to him, though, he seems very young. It's not that he's trying to be. That's just his spirit. 
Um, he, um, yeah, I don't know. He was the original primal punk. And nobody else ever got that, nobody. With all due respect. God bless Johnny Rotten, but that was minor league in terms of the impact of the music. Of course, this one won't go away. This, uh, this was shot for their uh, Queen 2 album, which was their second album, but it didn't come about so simply. Um, I had a meeting with them, didn't really know them, and they weren't particularly known at that moment in time. And um, I, uh, well, what happened was, a friend of mine called John Cabal, big collection of old Hollywood stills that would get thrown out on the lot. There was some time in the late 50s, early 60s, they were just throwing stuff out. They would throw movies out too. That I can't deal with that. And, and probably they couldn't have dealt with it because there was none of the copying devices that there are today. Anyway, he wanted some pictures for a book he was writing. Maybe it was a book on Elena Dietrich. And he showed me some big prints. And um, the one I wanted was this one. Uh, it's not as... Um, when I did, I was inspired by it. And of course, there are four. And she was, you know, they were very, like, a little fiddly because they hadn't really, they'd only done one studio session before, and that was with me. So, um, anyway, we took the pictures. And there was some debate afterwards about what should be the cover, and um, the white one or the black one. I mean, I, well, I'm just a photographer, but I know me and Freddie thought that one should be it, which makes sense. I mean, we were the visual members of this, of, say, the five of us. Anyway, it did become the colour, thank God. And, um, it's, and then it got copied for um, Bohemian Rhapsody two or three years later. There's a whole thing <laughs> around this photograph. And um, it's, yeah, I mean, I look at it and go, I mean, they were amazingly cute too. It wasn't like I started with the Dead Boys Day. Although I love the Dead Boys. I did, a big, I did an album cover for them. Of course, the other one I did it for, and personally, I didn't know them so well, uh, is the Ramones. But the Ramones have become the American, you know, prototype of punk. In, in England, they tend to think more of, uh, of the Sex Pistols. But, but that wasn't, it was defined spiritually, whereas they had their image. I mean, that's why in the pictures that I took, after I'd taken the ones in the T-shirt, which is what they were looking for, this is the shot that, um, that I put in books and shows, because they got the leather jackets on. <laughs> and I thought that was an important factor. And so Queen, yeah, and I did Sheer Heart Attack, and they, of course, had a wonderful career, and God bless them. I, it's um, Freddie and I would talk quite a bit over the years. He was, um, he was a really nice guy. I mean, he wasn't, you know, he, and he could deliver. He did, yeah, he did like to tell how fabulous he thought the band were, and himself, and you know what? They are, or they were, and so I think it's all right to do that if you really have the goodies. So, as we're going to go on, I think we're going to see a little bit more DB. Aha, the terrible trio, or the unholy trinity. And that's, there was, he was managing David and Iggy, and he wanted Lou. But it didn't happen. However, this, this was a shot that I wanted, even though with none of them that well known at the time, but I knew that thing, they belong together spiritually. Um, 
And I was this day, it was they had flown over RCA Records, a load of journalists, to interview David and um, disseminate um, some propaganda uh, for Ziggy Stardust, which had not yet been released. But it's these three, you know, I mean, they had a huge influence on culture, not just in America and England. Ah ha ha! Lady Gaga and um, Bonner. So my stuff does a bit of time travel. Go back to 69, right at the beginning, Sid and the car. I mean, there was no wheel on that one. It was a whole thing. I got fabulous pictures, because the car. Then these two, the sa, 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 didn't think about this shot for years. And it popped up small somewhere, I can't remember. And people love it. I probably, it's out there. It's one of those that I sell more prints of. Uh, well, there's a couple of others, but that. This is one of my favorites. And it's a little enigmatic, if you think about it, because it's obviously going to get on stage to play. And there's all that sun and light coming through. But this was the last tour, and he would sometimes do two gigs in an evening. So this would have been the early one, probably. You probably have them at six and nine. So, but I love it. And the grain. It's like one of those things where years later you look at it and you go, wow, bam-a-lama. Mm. Yeah, one of those perfect sessions. So I was in and out of New York in those years and somehow got to know the uh, art director well, he owned, he owned Penthouse, Bob Guccione, and he also owned uh, another magazine, like a women's magazine. And she, Heart of Glass, that was what was going on. They wanted promotion for Heart of Glass. And, um, well, it was a magical session. And she looks, I don't think she's had, had, had any face work though. Unlike, say, Marilyn, and then there's, of course, Lou Reed. This is one of his favorite sessions. Of course, Transformer, which must be here somewhere. Um, but there was something about that. Uh, this would have been, yes, this would have been in London in the, would it be the summer of 75 or 76? And I had a studio there for a while in the West End near Leicester Square. But we used to have fun, Lou and I, like invent scenarios in our head, but not get bogged down in styling it. Just talk about it in a more metaphysical way. So, uh, and that was his all-time favorite studio session, I know. God bless you, Lou Reed. I learned a lot from Lou. Anyway, Mrs. here we are at Mrs. Salon with Mick Rock and his, uh, well, some representatives from his archives of many years. So we are treating this like an exhibition, and they are going to be available for sale. And some money is going to some kind of charity. And uh, I'll give you a date soon. I think it's early December. This picture of David... I think it was taken in Scotland. Uh, we would bugger about sometimes. I've got some silly pictures. But I love this one. I mean, it's not one they would, that anyone who was selling David would want to put out. David slashing his wrist. I don't think David would, well, I was never suicidal, that's for sure. I may have been bats in the belfry. Different. But, uh, yeah, he liked that. Lou Reed and Nico. Ah. One was taken in 75, must have been in Blake's Hotel, London, in South Kensington. And Lou, that was his favourite hotel to stay at, which wasn't far from where I lived, conveniently. So we would see each other quite a lot. But he, there was just something about the two of them. Obviously, she's not in her blonde glory of the 1967 
um, velvet underground photographs. She was, uh, she said to me, she said, oh, he, he was, I'm, I'm sure, uh, whatever. It was more than just a little brother. But she felt he was like a little brother to her inside. I've, he's, I've got these tapes of, I mean, what she did with the Velvets and what she did in Chelsea Girls and some other stuff over the years, that was one thing. But these tapes that Lou had, she was like, wow. She was wailing. So, and then there's the fantastic, the divine. I think she's a true artist. You know, it's hard for people in, you know, I mean, we're both alive and working nowadays. It's, uh, she's, she's just, uh, she's got a, a thing. One is she's very photogenic, but two, she has a unique flavoring and she has a great whacked out sense of humor. I have a lot of good pictures of her already. But including she was in my documentary, Karen O of the Year, Year, Years. God bless her. I, the minute I saw her perform, I thought, Phew. you know. And she's not hurried herself. She does what she does, what she wants to do. And she's timeless already. You know, I mean, they did a few albums, and, but she's already there. Yes, yeah, so that I had a studio. And, Leicester Square for a few years and I photographed Lou. Well, he had a short blonde and then early in the year, the time of Sally Can't Dance, he had the long blonde. I like this one, this, uh, and um, I think we were thinking about the Young Lions, which Marlon Brando as like, you know, a, um, <laughs> we talked a lot about that. He was like a Nazi with soul, Marlon was. And um, anyway, I have a whole load of pictures of him in this mode. And there I am, looking like younger than springtime, you know. Not quite me. Okay, not younger than springtime. More like springtime. How's that? So, listen, there's a lot of other stuff I could have put up. But, you know, if it's enough to make your tail wag, then I feel I, w I would have done the job that I was meant to do. Thank you for laying your eyes on this. Here I am at uh, Mrs. We're in the process of naming it, Mrs. Salon, I like. So, uh, well, it's just a great place to show art, you know. It's not quite as, there's nothing wrong with antiseptic. Sometimes that's good because of the space you can squeeze a lot in. But I like the spirit. I think they found a nice little home here for a while. There's a certain, whatever the fuck it is, you know, bohemian thing. But like, not, you know, not street bohemian. It's like bohemian with mythology. That's what I like. It's like I like a lot of these characters. I think of them in mythological terms. I mean, Hedwig certainly was. Obviously, these two were, and obviously Karen, and Debbie, and David, and Quinn. I mean, okay, that's it. I may do another one of these a bit later, but this is plenty of stuff for you to digest. Uh, but thank you for watching, and we will keep you informed when this exhibition is launched. I've been trying to think about a title for it, and I came up with, what did I come up with? Find it, finding the focus. I thought, well, that's vague enough, but it's related, obviously. And um, we will give you quite active on that new media stuff, but as things get closer to, it's going to be in early December, then we'll let you know and probably do some of that you know, jazzy online stuff. God bless you, one and all.